Good morning. I was told that uh, Jordan was going to introduce me in a video, but he forgot my name. <laughs> and uh, I'm Jim Gattel, and it's just a real privilege uh, for me to be here today. And uh, I feel honored to be asked by Jordan to come and preach. Uh, most of you probably don't know, but this actually is my home church. When my family moved to Orange County in 1966, we attended Costa Mesa First Assembly, located there at the corner of 22nd Street and Eldon, which eventually merged with a Newport Beach church to become Newport Mesa uh, Church. And uh, Carla and I, my wife and I, were actually married. Carla's here this morning. Can you wave your hand at everybody, honey? <laughs> Carla. She, she normally does attend here when she doesn't have ministry elsewhere. But uh, we, uh, uh, we were married there in uh, the uh, sanctuary at 22nd and Eldon, which now houses an Armenian Orthodox church. And uh, my father's funeral was held in that sanctuary there. Uh, Dr. George Wood uh, ministered, uh, at that, was the pastor at that time. And uh, my mother attended this church for many years until she moved to Texas to live with my sister. And uh, this church has supported us as missionaries from day one of us becoming Assembly of God missionaries way back in 1984. We began as missionaries to Thailand, and then in 1997, we changed to being U.S. missionaries. And we're so grateful for the church's support. You have stood by us all these years in many different situations. And uh, I mentioned Carla, but Tracy, also our youngest daughter, attends church here when they don't have ministry elsewhere. So I'm honored to be uh, speaking here today. Uh, Ted and Beth, are <laughs> my daughter Beth, oldest daughter Beth, and her husband Ted, they're also members of the church here and are here every Sunday, and their children Noah and, and, and Gideon are part of the children's programs here. So I'm honored to be speaking here today, and I, I especially feel honored that Jordan would ask me to speak when he's not going to be here. And I hope he and uh, Tara have a, a great uh, time of rest. And uh, I appreciate my family coming. I've mentioned uh, Carla and Tracy and Beth, but also Trina, uh, my second youngest daughter. She left her church. She's involved in ministry there. She left her church to come and be here today because it's Father's Day. And then my brother and his wife, my brother David and his wife, uh, Lisa, and their uh, youngest son, Taylor, is, is, is here with us today. And so I'm so grateful for, for you guys coming. Today is Father's Day, and uh, it's a day to acknowledge and honor fathers and the role they play in the life of their children. And I had a great father, a wonderful father, a real man of God, for which I am uh, deeply grateful. But I do feel it's important to acknowledge that Father's Day is a difficult day for many people. As Mother's Day is difficult for many, so also is Father's Day. For some of us, our relationship with our father is complicated, with some good and some bad. Then for others, our relationship with our father is either poor or non-existent. Perhaps your relationship with your father is, is not good, or perhaps you don't even have a relationship. Maybe your father was emotionally distant. Maybe he was never around. Maybe he was even abusive. Issues like that make it difficult for us to show our appreciation for our father. Or an entirely different kind of issue, perhaps Father's Day is difficult for some because one has a desire to be a father, but it's never happened. Or maybe you are a father and your children ignore you or live far away. Or another issue is perhaps you lost your father and are still grieving. There are lots of reasons that can make Father's Day a difficult time for someone. And if you are someone for whom Father's Day is difficult, it is my hope and prayer that God, our Heavenly Father, will comfort you and reveal himself to you in ways that will overwhelm you with his grace and his love. Jordan asked me to talk about lessons I have learned from my experience of being a father, and so I'm happy to do that. And I do have a text that I would like to direct your attention to. It's Mark uh, chapter 9, 
verses, 19, uh, verses 14 to 29. I won't take time to read that whole story. It's quite an quite a involved, uh, a long story there. But I will be reading verses 20 to 24. But let me give you the ton- context to the verses I'll be reading first. <clears throat> a father had brought his son, who was possessed by a demon, to Jesus for hoping for his son to be delivered from this demonic uh, oppression, demonic possession. And the demonic possession was such that the boy couldn't speak. But also, the demon would sometimes cause the boy to fall into a fire or water to try to kill him. So he had to be, he had to be, the boy had to be watched all the time. So let me go ahead and read verses 20 to 24. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, he immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible to one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, so thankful for this opportunity to be with my friends here, to be in your house, to be worshiping you, and to be able to look into your word. And Lord, I just pray that as we look into your word and and as I share the the, the sermon that I feel that you've given me to share, I just pray that you will minister to each one of our hearts today. I thank you for it. In your name we pray, amen. You'll excuse me, I sometimes my mouth gets dry. I used to blame it on the high blood pressure pills I I took, but probably it's because I'm nervous too. (laughs) And for all of you OCD people, uh, forgive me for leaving the lid off. It'll just make it easier for me to take a drink. (laughs) But um, today on Father's Day, I want to focus on this father. Imagine having a child who had to be watched constantly for years. He had to be watched for fear that he might injure or kill himself. That's a tough life for a parent. In fact, I know a father who is in that situation, not because of demon possession, but because of autism. When I hear stories of families who have severely autistic children, my heart goes out to them. As a father, I can't imagine having a child in that condition. I think that parents who have children who have severe developmental uh, disabilities and then care for them and advocate for them for years on end are heroes. I do know a little bit about what this father was going through though because I've been the father of a troubled son. Not as bad as this situation, thank God, but I know what it's like when your son needs help and you feel helpless. Somehow this man whose son was demon possessed had heard about Jesus and he brought his son to Jesus for for deliverance. Now, actually, he first brought his son to Jesus' disciples, and they weren't able to cast the demon out. When Jesus heard about it, he said, bring the boy to me. So when the boy was brought to Jesus, the demon acted out, making the boy fall to the ground, making him roll around, and causing him to foam at the mouth. The man said to Jesus, if you can do anything, please help us. You notice that that man didn't say, please help him. The man completely identified with his son. Take pity on us and help us. Jesus responded to the if in the request. Jesus said to him, everything is possible for him who believes. The man didn't try to hide his doubt. He said, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. The man's statement seems contradictory, doesn't it? But I think what the man was trying to say was that he believed that Jesus had the power to do it. Maybe he knew others who had been healed or had had demons cast out of them. That's why he brought his son to Jesus. 
He knew that Jesus had the ability to heal people. His problem was he wasn't sure that Jesus would actually choose to heal his son. And so he asked for help in having faith that Jesus would specifically heal his son. This man is the kind of father I want to be. A father who is an advocate for his children. A father who is willing to ask for help when he himself does not have the resources. A father who is willing to admit his shortcomings in order to receive the help his children need. Now this man ended up getting what he hoped for. But I have to admit that my prayer has not always had the results that I wanted. But I always want to be a father who works to get his children the help that they need. Are you a person who likes quotes? I enjoy collecting quotes. I've collected quotes for many years. You know, it used to be you'd have to clip them out of the paper or, or something. And nowadays you can just, you know, type them into a file on your, on your phone or have them on your computer. The writer, Rachel Wolchin, has some great quotes. One that grabbed me because I identify with it is, my entire life can be described in one sentence. It didn't go as planned. And then she added the words, and that's okay. I have to admit, when I first started using that, that quote, I left off, and that's okay. I just said, my li entire life can be described in one sentence. It didn't go as planned. But I'm going to change the quote a little bit today. My entire life can be described in one sentence. But then I'm going to add, but God was always faithful. Or to put it all together, my entire life can be described in one sentence. It didn't go as planned, but God was always faithful. And that's the way my life has been, and also my life as a father. My life has not always gone as I planned or hoped. But I have discovered that God's love and care for me and for my family has been constant. God has always been faithful. I'd like to tell you about three times when God's faithfulness has been made real to me as a father in the midst of unplanned events in my life. One of the most difficult situations I ever experienced was when our son Joseph our oldest son, had emotional problems when he was a student at Vanguard University. And along with his emotional problems were behavioral problems that were severe enough that he had to move out of the dorm at Vanguard. I'm not divulging any secrets here. Joe talks about it. And, and before I, uh, I, I talked to him before I decided to share his, his story a little bit and asked his permission. Joe actually would have been uh, dismissed from the university, except that Carl and I, who were missionaries in Thailand at the time, uh, were home on uh, deputational ministry here, and we were able to make a home for him here. Joe became so depressed that we worried that he might harm himself. It was a period of time that, for a period of time there, we had to watch over him and, and keep close tabs on him. At the time, it was a crushing blow to us. Before that uh, happened, I kind of felt, I have to admit, I kind of felt we had, you know, the perfect family, which may have been one reason why it was such a crushing blow. <laughs> it was a blow to our pride. But if not a perfect family, at least we were doing what we wanted to do as missionaries, and our children were, quote, well-adjusted, unquote, <laughs> whatever that means. Up to that point, everything had been going pretty well as we had planned and hoped. We had completed two terms as missionaries in Thailand and were coming home to leave our children, Joe and Beth, in college and then return to Thailand uh, for a third term as a couple. Beth had just graduated from high school in Thailand. We thought everything was going great. Joe was starting her, his second year here at Vanguard and Beth was starting her first. But then the leadership here at Vanguard informed us that due to emotional and behavioral issues, Joe could no longer remain in the dorm. So the illusion of having the good family and, and, and being well-adjusted was soon ruined beyond repair. 
Some of Joe's problems were a result of him being what is called a third culture kid. He had grown up in Thailand and adjusting to life here in California was not easy. Some of it was physical in that he had been diagnosed as diabetic when he began college. Some of it was him was individuating as a young adult. Some of it was him reacting to how he had been raised in a conservative Christian home. But it killed me as his father to see him dealing with issues that had been created to my way of thinking by choices that I had made. Yes, he made his own choices, and some of the problems would have existed no matter who his parents might have been or wherever he grew up. But he didn't choose as an American to go and grow up in Thailand. That was a choice his father and mother had made. That time was one of the darkest of my life. Here we were, Assembly of God missionaries to Thailand, going from church to church, sharing our, our ministry, seeking financial support so that we could return to Thailand, telling people how great things were, and our family was really, really struggling. I felt like I was dying inside. And of course, when you are dealing with young adults, there's only so much a parent can do. When kids are small, you can pretty well corral them if you need to. But when they're over 18, they make, they make their own decisions. All we knew to do was to love him, to pray hard, and get good counseling for him. Vanguard University worked with us too. They were kind to us as a family, and they, they were redemptive. And Carla and I actually extended our time here in California uh, to help Joe and Beth adjust to life here. I wish I could say that the situation uh, resolved itself miraculously in an instantaneous way. God did do miracles, but they did take time and effort. And sometimes that's the way miracles happen, isn't it? But the fi time finally came when we could return to Thailand as a couple, feeling good about Joe and Beth enrolled here at Vanguard. And now all these many years later, Joe is pastoring a church in the San Fernando Valley. And so I can say about that period in my life, it didn't go as planned, but God was always faithful. Another unplanned event happened when Carl and I became parents to, orphaned, uh, to five orphaned children. Carla's youngest brother and his wife were killed in an auto accident in 1997, 22 years ago last month. They were the parents of five children ages 10, 9, 7, 4, and 2. The children were in the car with their parents, but they weren't, uh, they weren't seriously injured. Carla and I had just returned, to, when the accident happened, Carla and I had just returned to Thailand after we had left Joe and Beth here as students in Vanguard. But when the accident happened, Carla got on a plane to come to California to be with her family while I stayed there in, in Thailand. After the funeral, she emailed me and said, I need to talk to you on, on the telephone. Something has come up that I, I really can't write about. So we talked on the phone, and she told me that the plan had been for her parents to raise their five, the five children, their, their grandchildren. Then she became aware of a family secret. Another family member had come to her and told her that it wasn't right for her parents uh, to raise the children because her father, the children's uh, grandfather, was a child molester. Carla then confronted her father and he confessed. She's one of the most uh, courageous women that I know. And she told me that she had begun taking care of the children. Well, as you can imagine, all this came as quite a shock to me there in Thailand. I was expecting after the funeral and her being there for a few days to get back on a plane and join me in, in Thailand. And, uh, and that's what, at that point, I was hoping for. But, th but then Carla said, can we adopt these children? I said, let me come back to California and let's talk about it. But I knew what would happen. I knew that my life in Thailand as a missionary was over. Sometimes circumstances compel you and you know what the right thing to do is whether you want to do it or not. There was no one else in the family who could care for the children. If we did, didn't do it, they would just go into the state of California foster care system. 
I have to admit to you, I didn't really want to do it. I wanted to be a missionary in Thailand. I didn't even know all the children's names. We hadn't spent that much time with them. When we were in California, we could only see them at, we only saw them at family events. For most of their lives, we had lived overseas in Thailand. I had to ask Carla their names so that I could try to memorize them on the, on the plane ride home. Unfortunately, I still have problems with their names. <laughs> Tra Tracy uh, still complains that I call her by her sister's name. But I am so grateful to God that in their hour of need, God selected me to be the father of those five children. All but one is grown up now, and I am so proud of them and grateful to God for their lives. The reason why I say all but one is grown up is that two years after we became the children's parents, the middle child, Taryn, became ill with viral pneumonia and passed away at age nine. That was heartbreak upon heartbreak. But for the remaining four, each one has a heart for God. The three girls, Tamara, Trina, and Tracy, all are Assembly of God credentialed ministers like their mother and, and their older sister. Their older brother, Tim, is married with, with two children, and he and his wife are active in their local church. The last 22 years have not always been easy, but we have received help from many different people at various times. I know when we first came home, I didn't even know what I would do because I'd been a missionary for quite a long time. And so I'll, I'll never forget sitting in the office with uh, Ray Rachels and his wife, uh, Judy, and uh, Carl and I were there and talking to him and just saying, well, maybe I'll try to pastor a church or be an assistant pastor or something I, I didn't know. He said to me, what would you think about being the director of intercultural ministries for the SoCal Network? You know, you like to be real spiritual at times like that and go, well, let me think about it, let me pray about it. I, I think I grabbed it like a, like a drowning man. I said, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> but uh, we've received so much help from different people at various times, and many people have prayed for us. Actually, as it turned out, when the children were minors, uh, we couldn't adopt them. With all the issues involved with their situation, the children are always wards of the court. We had a spiritual adoption ceremony at our church, but it wasn't a legal adoption. The kids did use the name Gattel as their last name in school, but it really, it really wasn't their, their legal name. Then when Tim, the oldest, turned 18, he approached Carla and asked. He said, is it possible for you to get in touch with our attorney for me? Carla, somewhat apprehensively, as you can imagine, said, why? Now that he had turned 18 and was legally an adult, who knows what he might want? He said, well, you haven't been able to legally adopt me, but now that I'm 18, I can do what I want, and I want to legally adopt you and dad as my parents. Then each of the children adopted Carla and me as their parents when they turned 18. I can say of becoming parents of those five orphan children, it didn't go as planned, but God was always faithful. Another unplanned event in my life was when I experienced kidney failure and received a kidney transplant. It was in 2013 that my kidney began to fail and eventually I went on the list for a kidney transplant. At the time, I was the director of the SoCal School of Ministry and it became more and more difficult to fulfill my responsibilities. The biggest problem was that I had no energy. I just, I just would fall asleep at my desk. One nice thing about, if there can be a nice thing about kidney failure, is you, there's no pain uh, related to it. Uh, but uh, you, you start to itch quite badly, but, uh, but there's at least no pain. But eventually it got so bad that I just wasn't able to do the job I was needed to do that Carla was made the director of the School of Ministry in my place. It's the grace of God that I had a wife who was qualified and could take my position at work. And so we traded positions. She, uh, she went to work and I was a house husband. But uh, my, my health continued to decline. I was hoping for healing or a kidney transplant, but it just, it wasn't happening. Then on Monday, the, uh, Thanksgiving week in 2015, we got a call 
from a lady in Houston. Now this lady, uh, we, had, uh, we were friends, she was friends with my wife, and we had attended the same church together uh, when this family lived in California, but then uh, they, they moved to the Houston area and uh, were still part of the Assemblies of God there in, in Houston. And uh, she had moved several years prior to this, but she and her family had, she had stayed in touch with Carla on Facebook. And so she knew, she was aware of the fact that I needed a kidney. And when she called that Monday morning, she told us of a terrible accident that had happened that Friday night at, at the, uh, there in the church family. And that is two 16-year-old boys were playing with a gun and uh, they thought all the bullets had been taken out, but unfortunately one was still in the chamber. And so one boy put the gun up to his best friend's head and pulled the trigger and, and, and shot him. And the uh, boy was taken to the hospital, but by Monday morning his parents were told he was brain dead and the hospital per personnel asked his parents a question that no parent would want to hear, would you be willing to donate his organs to people who need them? His mother said she had always hoped her son would grow up to be a preacher. I don't know how, I can only think it's the grace of God, that she thought to say that at that horrible time. But she asked, did they know of any ministers who needed organs? They called the Assemblies of God Church, of which they were a part of, where the family were members, and asked the pastor, Pastor said, well, I don't, I don't really know of any, but our friend just happened, just happened to be at the church uh, that morning, and she remembered me. She was not a church employee, but on that Monday morning, she was filling in for the church secretary who was on vacation to be with her family during Thanksgiving week. And so when they called the church and our friend was there, uh, uh, she remembered me, and she said, yes. And uh, she called us, she got my information, and the family signed papers bequeathing one of Dylan's kidneys to me. Turned out his blood type was the same as my blood type. So on Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving in 2015, I received a kidney transplant. There were complications, but God and working with the doctors brought me through every one. The kidney functions well, and I am doing well, for which I am grateful to God. Praise God. After I recovered and my strength had returned, I wanted to get back involved in ministry. Carla was still the director of the School of Ministry, and it was continuing to do well under her leadership and had even grown. It just wasn't right for me to take my old position back. She was, she was doing so well. I think she is a better administrator than, than I had been. And Joe, our son, was working to start a church up in Chatsworth. And I thought, well, why? I'm sure he could use me to help him in the church somehow. So I decided to begin driving up to Chatsworth weekly to assist him. So now for over two years, I have been driving up to Chatsworth to assist him in, in the church plan. I have to tell you, it's the most fulfilling thing I've ever done in my life, to be able to assist my son in planning a church. Now, it used to bother me that I had to have a kidney transplant. After all, I am Pentecostal. We believe in divine healing, don't we? I was prayed for a lot when I was in kidney failure. Why didn't God just heal my kidney? It would have been a lot less trouble, I can tell you. But then one day, and it just came to me in a flash one day as I was driving up to Chatsworth, I realized if it wasn't for the kidney transplant, I never would have had the opportunity to work with Joe. If God had just healed my kidney, I probably would still be leading the SoCal School of Ministry. I probably would be too tired to drive to Chatsworth after administrating at the SoCal School of Ministry all week. So I'm grateful to God that he did not heal my kidney and I had to have a kidney transplant. And I can say of kidney failure and my kidney transplant, it didn't go as planned, but God was always faithful. Praise God. Praise God. Yes, hallelujah. 
Today I, today I want to close by asking the question, what crisis are, are you facing? I hope the answer would be none at all. But the truth of the matter is, in a group this large, I'm sure there are many people who are facing crises in their life, facing difficult situations that you do not know where to turn. And for the one who are not facing any difficulties, it is only a matter of time before you will be facing one. That is the human condition. But just as a father in our text with his demon-possessed son took his son to Jesus for help, so Jesus is here, and you can go to Jesus for help as well. Jesus wants to minister to you. As I close also, let me mention, there may be some who don't have a relationship with Jesus, and so you don't feel like you can go to him for help. Or maybe you have had a relationship with him in the past, but are not currently following him. I want to pray for you as well. But before I pray, I want to give you the opportunity to begin a relationship with him. All it takes is for you to ask Jesus to come into your life, to forgive him, to forgive you of your sins, and to ask him to be Lord of your life. Could everybody stand, please? Before I pray, I would like to ask, are there people here today who don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord and would like to begin a relationship with Him? Or perhaps, as I mentioned earlier, you followed Jesus in the past, but you realize that your relationship is not current. You know, it is a daily decision we make to follow Jesus. And you would like to start again. You would like to start over. Jesus is here and he's ready and willing to renew that relationship with you. Could, I, could everyone bow your heads and close your eyes please? Because I do want to ask for those of you who would like to begin a relationship with Jesus or start a new relationship with Jesus, I'd like to ask you just to raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way, but if you just raise your hand and put it right back down, just it, it's a sign from you that you want to to, it's an affirmation of your heart that God sees. And, and of course, I, I see. And I, I want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. To help our friends that want to begin a, or, re, or renew their relationship with Jesus, I'd like to ask us all to pray out loud together. Follow me in this prayer. Please repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Thank you for dying on the cross so I can have forgiveness for my sin. Please forgive my sin. Please come into my heart and life. Please make me a new creature. I want to follow you. I want you to be Lord of my life. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and meant it, the Bible tells us that you have been forgiven of your sin and you've received eternal life. And now I want to pray for you and then I want to pray for all of those that are here that are facing a crisis in your life and don't know where to turn. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. We're so grateful that you're such a wonderful Father. You're good all the time. You love each one of us. And Lord, for those that are facing a crisis in their life that don't know where to turn, I just pray right now that as that, that man with a son who is demon-possessed brought him to Jesus and you delivered that, that, that son, that you would reach into their situation and deliver them right now, Lord. Lord, I just pray that faith would take hold in their heart, that, that faith would arise that they would begin to see your hand working in their situation, Jesus. Lord, I pray for if there's relationship issues, if there are financial problems, if there's physical issues, whatever the problem may be, employment issues, whatever the problem may be, Lord, we are so grateful that there is no problem that is impossible for you. And Lord, I just pray that you would begin to minister now to each of my friends. Lord, I pray for those that raise their hands, you would, 
that they would have a sense of your love for them and your care for them. Lord, they would know that you are with them all the time. And Lord, I just pray that they would, that you would reveal yourself to them in a way that is deeper than ever before. We're just so grateful for your goodness and your love and your grace. In your name we pray, amen.